Hello everybody, um, this is going to be a slightly shorter than average Wednesday special, although hopefully still a bit longer than the average five minute guide. Um, this is purely because there are two fairly substantial videos due next week, and they've taken in quite the bit of time to research and prepare over the last few weeks, and this week is basically dedicated mostly to production of those two, um, which has cut in to my research and production time for this week's video. Unfortunately, there are only so many hours in the day. Um, so with that in mind, hopefully you look forward to next week's video and hopefully you enjoy this one. So let's get on with discussing the last of the Splendid Cats, HMS Tiger. So HMS Tiger was a one-off battle cruiser of the Royal Navy. After the first run of the Invincible and Inflexible class of battlecruisers, the British settled into a pattern of ordering a new class of battleships each year, and a single battlecruiser accompanying them. This battlecruiser was usually, to a degree, derived from the battleship class of the year, as well as iterating on the previous battlecruiser that had been built the year before. Thus, with the Orion class building in 1909 and 1910, the Lion and Princess Royal match. The King George V's in 1911 were matched by HMS Queen Mary, and the Iron Dukes of 1912 were matched by the Tiger. With the Queen Elizabeth's following the next year, it's uncertain if the proposed successor to Tiger, HMS Leopard, would have broken the trend and iterated from Tiger as a 13.5-inch gunship, or followed the general battlecruiser trend and become something like the eventual Renown class. Although some evidence exists that the original plan, a once Fisher's demands for an all battle cruiser year, had been fended off, and yes, he genuinely did want to pause battleship construction for a year to build an entire fleet of battle cruisers. But anyway, uh, one of the early plans that I referred to were that the Queen Elizabeths were to be slower but armed with 10 15 inch guns, so effectively Iron Dukes on steroids with the turrets upgraded. Then Leopard, being called a Super Tiger, would effectively be a slightly smaller and slower version of what would eventually become HMS Hood. And the original plans for Design Y were kind of another iteration of this, which has been discussed in a Dry Dock episode. Anyway, the Tiger represented something of a step away from the battleship derivative design. The previous 13.5-inch gun battlecruiser's lineage could be seen relatively easily when you look at their matching battleships. Whereas these had five turrets in the A, B, Q, X, Y formation, the Lions and Queen Mary had, in very simplistic terms, swapped X turret for more engines and their associated funnels. This meant that their eight-gun broadside included Q turret with somewhat restricted fire arcs. Tiger changed this by moving the machinery all together and relocating the third turret completely, not in a position analogous to Q or X on the Iron Dukes, but the turret was still named Q due to the fact that it was not super firing, as an X turret would be in Royal Navy nomenclature, and so the turret was still broadly amidships but with much better fire arcs. The space between the two turrets was partly due to the presence of the rear torpedo room, which sat neatly between the magazines of the two turrets. And as we said, even though this position was not ideal, it still offered a far superior field of fire to its predecessors. Additionally, the maximum belt armour, although it was not increased past the nine inches of previous ships, was extended to cover more of the ship, which made it better protected. The end result was, by all accounts, a fairly good-looking ship, which motored around happily at 28 knots, driven by four screws, which derived their power from engines generating 85,000 sharp horsepower, although on trials she would actually manage to make 29 knots. She displaced 28,500 tonnes at normal load, and carried a main battery of eight 13.5-inch guns in four twin turrets, two superfying to, yeah, to super firing forward and the aforementioned midships and rear turrets aft. Secondary armament consisted of 12 casement mounted 6 inch guns and a grand total of two 3 inch anti aircraft guns. <laughs> 
Four submerged torpedo tubes were installed with an unusually large capacity of 20 torpedoes, with one launcher on either side of the ship forward of the frontmost turret, and another pair either side between the rear turrets. She was laid down in June 1912, launched in December 1913, and was still being finished when war broke out in August 1914. Final commissioning took place in October of the same year, but there is a reasonable amount of evidence that this was somewhat rushed, as its training and shakedown crews was cut quite short, and then it was brought into the fleet in order to replace the Princess Royal, which had been detached to other duties. Admiral Beatty, on seeing the ship, described it as unfit to fight, since three of the four electricity-generating dynamos had seized up completely, meaning that she didn't actually have enough power to run all her systems. And her crew's gunnery was downright terrible, even by Beatty's standards. Normally, these issues would have been worked out and fixed during a shakedown cruise, but, of course, as we said, that rarely hadn't happened. Barely three months later, the ship would find itself thrown into action at the Battle of Dogger Bank, and with many of her crew still trying to figure out how to best perform their duties in the new ship, her gunnery remained terrible. She engaged the wrong target and left Moltke free to attack Lion unmolested, whilst firing off 355 main battery shells for only two hits, one on Seidlitz and one on Derflinger. In return, she would take six hits from the German ships, the one bright spot being that she endured these without much degradation to her fighting capacity, with the exception of an 11-inch hit to the roof of the midship's turret, which was mostly deflected, but did knock the turret out of action. The Battle of Jutland would be her next major action, and this barely started any better than Dogger Bank, with Beatty's terrible signalling resulting in Queen Mary and Tiger being left with no idea who to actually shoot at. And so, Tiger's commanding officer picked Moltke, when in fact she should have been engaging Seidlitz. Moltke was a fairly sharp opponent, and scored six hits within the first ten minutes of battle. But although her rear turrets were temporarily disabled, the Tiger once again proved to be very durable, as the guns came back into action, and the ship was not noticeably otherwise affected performance-wise. Up ahead, Queen Mary was somewhat more performance-impaired as it exploded, and Tiger had to turn quite hard to starboard to avoid hitting the wreck. Overall, during the first part of the Battle of Jutland, Tiger was hit 17 times, all but one of them scored by Moltke. But in contrast to her half-sister, she was somewhat unbelievably effectively shrugging off all comers and still combat capable. During the night, she would exchange fire with the German pre-dreadnoughts, driving them back, but not fast enough to allow her to chase down the fleeing German battlecruisers. These two engagements pretty much wrapped up her involvement in the fight, although her gunnery remained absolutely abysmal, with three hits out of just over 300 shells fired, she had taken 21 hits in total, including two 12-inch hits and 11 hits from 11-inch shells, but was still a mostly fully functional fighting unit at the end, showing an impressive degree of toughness for a class of ship that in pop culture is generally held to be a fragile floating bomb. Of course, not receiving any full penetrations to her turrets rather helped in this matter. On the way back to port, she and other ships took a few long-range main gunshots at a zeppelin which had turned up to observe them. After repairs, she would become the temporary flagship of the battlecruiser fleet whilst the somewhat more battered Lion was repaired, and then received a large refit in the winter of 1916, with reinforced deck and turret roof armour and more rangefinders added. A distant role at the Second Battle of Heligoland Bight, and the addition of a Sopwith Camel on a launch platform mounted on the midship's turret, and another small refit would see out her war service. She would survive the Washington Naval Treaty, albeit placed into reserve, and during this time she swapped her flying platform from the midship's turret to the upper forward or B turret, and replaced the 3-inch allowed aircraft notification systems 
with slightly more capable 4-inch anti-aircraft guns. Throughout the 1920s, she would serve as a training ship, briefly taking up active service again, whilst Hood went in for a refit toward the end of the 1920s. With the fleet restrictions and reductions of the London Naval Treaty, she would be paid off once Hood came back into service in 1931, and she would be sold for scrapping in 1932. There has been much said about possibilities of Tiger being retained instead of, say, perhaps one of the R-Class battleships, and modernised during the 1930s, with the idea being that as a relatively fast ship that's still armed with uh, capital-grade weapons, she would be a very useful combatant against ships such as the Deutschland-class Panzerschiff, and potentially even Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. Uh, especially assuming that she'd been refitted with some additional armour, sort of in the same way that Renown and Repulse were uh, to, at the end of World War One. However, whilst having another fast cruiser killer does sound like a good idea on paper, the fact of the matter is that the Royal Navy was a bit short on cash and was only really modernising its most valuable units, this is why the Queen Elizabeth class didn't even get full modernisations between themselves, and the R class got a little bit um, neglected, shall we say. So, in battlecruiser terms, with Hood basically kept in action throughout the 1930s as a flagship, and only Renown receiving a full refit and modernisation, with not even Repulse getting the same treatment, the chances of Tiger being at that point then the weakest armed of the Royal Navy's capital ships, if it had been retained, actually getting a full modernization refit are very, very unlikely. It's far more likely she would have had a very basic refit and modernization, much in the same manner as Repulse, which would have left her even more vulnerable than Repulse was, and obviously lesser armed. It also would have greatly complicated matters for the Royal Navy, as one of the beauties of the London Naval Treaty was that practically the entire Royal Navy's battle line was using the same 15-inch 42 caliber gun, with the exception, at least until the King George V started coming online in the late 1930s, of HMS Nelson and HMS Rodney, which of course had 16-inch guns. To introduce a separate caliber, the old 13.5-inch gun, and thus require the retention of a lot of old charges and shell stock, the production of new stock, etc., all for a single ship, would not have really been a very economical choice. And in the end, even a vaguely realistically refitted Tiger would still only be a match for, as we said, heavy cruisers, Panzer, Schiff, and to be perfectly honest, that's about it, um, with... Although the Scharnhorst class carry 11-inch guns, the difference in gun calibre and therefore firepower between the German 11-inch used on Scharnhorst and the 13.5-inch on Tiger is much, much closer than it would have than it was between the 11-inch on the Scharnhorst and the 15-inch on the old R-Class that we use for convoy escort duties, which is why the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau would refuse to engage the old R's. I have a distinct feeling that if HMS Tiger, for some reason, had been assigned to convoy escort duty and the two Scharnhorsts had come across her, then the Scharnhorst would have been quite comfortably within their rights to assault that convoy. And, to be perfectly honest, I don't see that being a fight that the Tiger is going to walk away from. Um, so it would have been throwing away a capital ship and a convoy, whereas obviously with the original timeline taking precedence, the retention of one of the R-Class meant that that convoy was saved because John Olsen and I now saw an old battleship with the corresponding heavy armour and weapons and went, mm, maybe not. That said, if Tiger had been retained... The two most practical uses I can see her being put to would either have been assigning her to the Mediterranean fleet, where the rebuilt Italian battleships were not spectacularly more heavily armed and nor spectacularly more heavily armoured, um, especially if you assume that Tiger would have received a few armour upgrades in the 1930s, 
And so especially for the early part of the Mediterranean War, she actually would have been a relatively useful battle line unit and with her superior speed might have been able to close down or force engagements with the rather quick Italian fleets that the uh, historic British battle line with its slightly lower average speed generally would fail to do. Once the Littorios start to come into service and show up in actions, it's obviously somewhat less advisable to have something like Tiger floating around in direct opposition, um, but she could have proved quite useful as then being moved over to the uh, Japanese theatre, the Pacific theatre, um, as a refitted Tiger versus the Japanese refits of the Congo would be a much more even fight, as assuming that she could arrange for a one-on-one -on -one duel. And to be perfectly honest, at that point, if she was sunk with Prince of Wales um, in Forsed in Repulse's place, it would have been less of a loss to the Royal Navy than the Repulse itself, which could still have been uh, relatively useful in certain circumstances, even though, as I said, she wasn't as well upgraded as Renown was. Assuming that she survived the Japanese theatre, I think it's probably fairly likely she would have had to been pulled off for um, refit and repair at that point in sort of late 41, early 42, at which point, if she'd been refitted with the uh, much heavier anti-aircraft suite that was generally par for the course for Royal Navy capital ships that survived to the mid and late uh, parts of World War II, she could then have formed a relatively useful fast carrier escort, much in the way that Renown escorted Ark Royal and as part of Force H during the Bismarck uh, chase aspect of World War II. And so, again, assuming that she had survived all of the aforementioned, she might have found a role as a fast carrier escort and effectively giant floating anti-aircraft battery uh, with the British Pacific Fleet towards the end of the Second World War. So those are possible future scenarios and uses for Tiger that could have played out if she'd been retained. But in the end, I think the Royal Navy probably made the right decision in keeping all of the R-Class, um, given their much greater utility and usefulness, especially during the first part of the war. So with that, hopefully you've enjoyed this video, and I will see you again in the next one. Thank you very much, and goodbye. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.